Warm welcome to Cumber Free Presbyterian Church for our morning worship. Uh, we're delighted to see you all. We want to warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. And it's lovely to see so many in, gathered, young and old alike, both upstairs and down. And also to some who are visiting with us. Uh, I do think we have uh, at least one Ukrainian with us today at the back. And uh, we just want to warmly welcome you in the Saviour's name. I'm not sure if he speaks English or not. He may know. Okay, so he, he, he'll understand then. Hopefully, uh, it'll be okay. And that's Donald, is it? Yes, as well. So lovely to see. And Jacqueline, is that the name? Okay. So you're very welcome, along with many others as well. And we're glad to see you. And we welcome you in the Saviour's name. Also to those listening on the World Wide Web, uh, Sermon Audio, Facebook, and YouTube. We do have an extensive online community. You're very faithful in supporting us, encouraging, and tuning in. And we warmly welcome you and your family. And trust the Lord will bless you today and meet us all at the point of our need. Just before we come to worship, I'd like you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 121, please. The Psalm 121. And we'll read these verses together, very familiar verses. You may not even need to turn to your Bible, but uh, these are very encouraging words. And I would imagine that there has to be in the house of God today uh, at least one child of the Lord, and you've met with discouragement, one child of God who has put on a brave face, has come to the house with your face well washed, and if you're like me, your head well shammied and shined, uh, you've come well dressed up, maybe even with a bit of makeup on, and uh, it hides the red eyes where the tears have fallen, and uh, a smile covers a broken heart. Uh, and I'm sure, and C. H. Spurgeon would have said, and he preached to tens of thousands, and sometimes more, in large congregations in the open air, and in his own building. He never needed a microphone. He had what is known as the bell tone, and his voice would just echo across the entire building. Uh, some tremendous stories about the use of his voice, but we'll not go there. Uh, but sufficient it is to say there's got to be, upstairs and down, whether a young person or older person, someone who has met with the devil, someone who's been discouraged. Well, you need a word from God today. There's no doubt about that. So easy to get down. You need a word from the Lord. Well, at least if we read the scripture and the book of God, there's sufficient here in this book, and I encourage you to read your Bible, read the Word of God, uh, and study it, memorize it. The young people doing their exam for the Sunday school and the Bible class, memorizing large portions of Scripture from the book of Proverbs, from the Psalms, from the New Testament, and then the catechism, the questions, and, and the answers, they, they've memorized them. And never say, oh, I couldn't memorize the Bible. Well, I'm sure you could memorize this psalm. You turn to the Word of God today. And this book, now listen to me, look at me. This book will encourage your heart today. These words will bless your soul today. God will give you something that this world and not your best friends could ever give His Word. And you need that Word today. You need it, and so do I. And I trust as we read the psalm, and then as we come to sing it, God will bless it to your heart and encourage you today. So let's read together and let's hear the word of the Lord. Psalm 121, a psalm or a song of degrees. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Amen. The Lord will bless his word to all of our hearts. We're going to turn to that psalm. We're going to sing it together. If you use the hymn book, then you'll turn to the psalm section on page 120. 
And then the words also will come up on screen if you're not using the hymn book. I to the hills will lift mine eyes from whence doth come mine aid. Let's just bow briefly in a word of prayer. We'll seek the Lord's face together, please. Just as we're bowed in prayer, I just want to pass on on behalf of the Ernie family circle, that's Diane and Brian, uh, their sincere thanks to the congregation uh, for their prayers during the recent bereavement of Mrs. Hogg, that is Diane's mother, Betty Hogg. Funeral service was uh, last Tuesday in the Dundonald Elam Church and uh, the family and friends gathered out and there was a good representation here from our own congregation in Cumber and Diane has asked me on behalf of the entire family just to thank you for your, your prayers, for the many cards that she has received at home as well uh, and also for those who have called at the house, attended the funeral or in helped in any way during their time of bereavement and no doubt during the time of her fall and now her much needed recovery and she does appreciate that and the whole family do and we would just like to pass on a sincere word of thanks from Diane and Bran and Alison, Mark and Matthew and the wider family to the congregation here uh, for your kindness and your thoughtfulness and above all for your prayers. There are ongoing needs there so please remember these individuals in prayer. Our brother Kyle McElroy, uh, well known in the congregation here, was rushed into hospital and had breathing difficulties. He had an infection in his throat and it had swollen up and he was struggling to breathe. He was rushed, uh, blue lighted as I understand, to hospital and uh, the Lord provided a way. He was able to get right through and had emergency sur uh, surgery uh, just last week at 3 a.m. in the morning and uh, we're thankful for those that are skilled and have the medical expertise to deal with these things and uh, he is recovering. Uh, he's still in hospital, he had hoped to get out, uh, but he's disappointed that he's not able to get out, but there's still ongoing uh, difficulties, and uh, we trust the Lord will be with him if he has to stay in just a few more days, and the Lord will just give him grace and patience, and the Lord will be with Laura and the whole family. And also John Ferguson, John's still in hospital, uh, please remember uh, Yvonne and Joe and Jolene, and Lewis and the whole family and remember Martha too, uh, John is uh, very ill and he does need help and the family need wisdom just at this difficult time. So we commend them all to thee and we trust the Lord will undertake. Our brother Colin, as you know, is out of hospital and he, he may make an appearance at some stage we don't know today or even on Tuesday night or it might be next week. Whatever it is anyway, uh, we just know that he's on the road to recovery. And we're thankful to the Lord for that. And we trust the Lord will bless him and others as well. So we're a church family. And as I said before, uh, someday your name may be on this list and mine. And we will be standing in the need of prayer. And it's a good thing to know that you've prayed for others. And you reap what you sow. 
and God will touch the hearts of others to pray for you as you have helped and prayed for these individuals. I do believe in, in fostering the spirit of hospitality, kindness and love and affection for one another. And I feel that if you can't go to visit people, and sometimes people don't like too many callers and we appreciate that, well, you can pray for them. That's number one. Uh, you can send a card. I think card ministry is a terrific thing. Now, you don't need to write an encyclopedia. And if you do send a card, it's not about you. And it's not about I'm this and I did that and I'm doing this and my children are uh, climbing the social ladder. Uh, do remember, it's about the person you're sending it to. Uh, think of them. Encourage them. And say a few words. And sometimes little is more. Uh, and I trust to be able to even start a card ministry in the house. And folks are not well. Uh, you'll be able to send them a card. It's as good as a visit at times. It's as good as a visit. And sometimes when you're not well, you're just not able to take a visit. So we understand that. So please pray for these individuals. Let's bow briefly before the Lord. Our loving Father, it is with gratitude and thanksgiving we enter again into thy most holy and sacred and loving presence. We thank thee for our Saviour today, the mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We stand by blood alone. We thank thee for Calvary. The only reason we can approach thee is because of the finished work and the shed blood of the Lamb. We dare not come in the name of a denomination, God forbid. We wouldn't stand on the merits of an institution. We realize, O oh God, we're sinners fit firewood for hell, and we ought to have been there, but for the grace of God. We're humbled before thee in that thought, and we approach thee, O oh God, reverently. We come before thee not with a, a light-hearted attitude. We do not come with flippancy. We realize that thou art God, and great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. Thou art holy, and just, and pure, and true. And Lord, thou art worthy of all praise and honor. Thou hast declared in thy word, and you're omniscient, you know all things. Beside me there is no God. And if there was a, another God or gods, you would have told us. But Lord, thou hast said, beside me there's none else, and we believe thee. And faith accepts thy word and believes God. And we come to worship thee, therefore, as the true and the living God. We believe that thou art, and a rewarder of them that diligently seek thee. And Lord, we come through the mediator. We stand upon the ground of that finished work, the atoning sacrifice, that one great offering for sin, the body and blood of Christ. We thank thee for the sorrows and sufferings of thine only begotten and well-beloved Son. We thank thee that he was the substitute. He took our place. He died for our sins. He suffered the just one for us, the unjust, to bring us to God. We thank thee that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling himself unto the world. And we lift our hearts to thee and we thank thee that we're numbered among that chosen number. We thank thee, O God, for salvation. We rejoice that, Lord, we are the redeemed of the Lord. We are God's elect. And, Lord, it's no good in us. It's no merit in us. Thou said, I have taken thee from the ends of the earth and chosen thee from the chief men thereof. And, Lord, just like Israel, Lord, you didn't set your love upon us because we were great and mighty. You didn't set your love upon us because we were good and honorable. Lord, sinners, enemies, rebels from God. Lord, as all mankind born in sin, shapen in iniquity, at enmity with God, rebels from the Lord, transgressors of thy holy law. We realize, O God, that at best, men at best, the best of them were not even among that category. Men at his religious, educational, and Lord, even moral best is still a sinner. But we thank thee, O God, that salvation is outside of ourselves. It's outside of the church. It's invested only in a single person, the blessed Son of the living God. And we worship thee today in his name. And we come to give thanks, Lord, for it is our duty. It's our responsibility. We believe, Lord, an act of worship, Lord, must include thanksgiving. It cannot be right or proper to be selfish, parochial. Lord, it could not be right, Lord, to bring, Lord, our own selfish needs before thee, but worship thee alone and first and foremost is priority today and we give thee thanks for who thou art the creator God of the ends
ends of the earth. We bow before thee and we acknowledge thee. We worship thee in the triune being that thou art, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship in spirit and in truth and in our union with Christ and the beauty of holiness. We come, O God, in the righteousness of Christ, accepted in the well-beloved. We stand upon his merit. There's no safer ground, no, not where glory dwelleth, even in Emmanuel's land. And loving Father, in the Saviour's name, we thank thee for the gift of the Holy Spirit who comes and he abides with us and he'll be within us. He empowers us. He equips us. He reveals Christ to us. He leads and guides us, directs. And we bless thee, Lord. He's the spiritual quickener. We thank thee for new birth. We thank thee for the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. We thank thee, Lord, when we fall, even as believers, we are restored by thy Spirit. And we rejoice you've given of thy good Spirit to us. The promised Holy Ghost has come. The Comforter abides with me. And we rejoice in all thy blessings, temporal, spiritual, food and clothing, warmth and shelter, health and strength, the use of all our faculties, several abilities bestowed upon us, much more beside, mercy seen and unseen. Lord, where would we stop? Where, where would we stop? stop? Lord, we wouldn't even know where to start. Lord, count your many blessings as Johnston Oatman Jr. penned and name them one by one. It will surprise you what the Lord hath done and we worship thee. We thank thee for our English Bible, the word of God in our mother tongue. We thank thee for those who translate the Bible into other languages, those that are learning languages have spent years, Lord, uh, mastering a language of a tribe just to bring the gospel, just to present the basics of the gospel, even the book of Genesis, the gospel of John. Lord, we thank thee painstakingly. They've mastered the language, difficult as it is to try to communicate the gospel and the gospel among all nations and the fulfillment of the Great Commission. And loving Father, we bless thee. We thank thee for this and we thank thee for our English Bible today, the word of God in our mother tongue, for the measure of civil and religious liberty. Lord, we realize we could be living in a country that bans the gospel, bans the Bible, imprisons believers, and would not have public worship. Well, we thank thee, Lord, for the measure of freedom we have to enjoy. No bulldozer at the gate, no padlocks, Lord, on the door, no security forces surrounding the building, hunting us down like dogs, but we rejoice. We have that relative freedom not only to worship at a building, but even this afternoon to go back into the open air to preach the gospel. Lord, we thank thee. These are no small mercies from thee. We acknowledge thy goodness and we give thee the glory. We thank thee too, Lord, for so great salvation. We thank thee for the person and work of thy dear son. In his name we pray for grace today and help, not only for ourselves here in Cumber. Remember our neighboring churches, our sister congregations. Remember the many outside of our own denomination that are faithful to the blood and to the book. Bless every ambassador of the cross, the preaching of thy word to believers, to the unconverted. We pray that this day will be a high day in the church, right across the province and the earth, that sinners would be converted, backsliders restored, thy people revived and built up in their most holy faith, the ministry of the word and the spirit, and the grace and gospel of God to the hearts of all. They touch upon the physical frame for those that are not well. Remember them today. We pray for Kyle. We pray for John. We cry to thee, Lord, you'll draw near to them. Remember Kyle McElroy, John Ferguson. You know all about them. We commend them to God. And we pray, Lord, you'll undertake for them. Remember our brother Colin today. We commend thy servant to thee. We pray for John Hamilton and Gemma and the family. Remember Diane Ernie and Bran and the whole family. Pray for our sister Betty Allister recovering from surgery. We thank thee, Lord, for thy hand upon many this past while. We pray for Brian and for Pat and for Ruth, Lord. Remember Philip Martin today, Lord. We pray for this lady, Sylvia, that's asked for prayer. We pray, Lord, for Owen and for Gladys McCartney. We cry to thee, Lord, for Heather and Hard Capper and the Arnolds and the Crawfords. And remember, Lord, even Heather... And hard young fellow David today. Remember Faith and the children. We commend them lovingly to thee. You know the need. We pray for this friend of Rita Peacock, Lord. We pray for uh, James E. Maxwell. Lord, undertake for him seriously in an hospital. And there's so many others on the list. Lord, we would spend a day praying over them, praying for them. And you know who they are. And we bring them all to thee. We think of the pressing need and the ongoing need. And we ask, Lord, loving Father, as a church family, you will pastor and you'll minister and you'll encourage. So bless us today. Bless the little ones, the young people of our congregation, the little lambs of the flock. Remember, Lord, the adults. We pray for our seniors. Thank you for a good day on Friday. And we ask for thy blessing upon the church family here. And we wouldn't be parochial. You know our prayers for other places and people. Lord, we commend them all to God and pray that this day 
will be a day to remember, not only because it is the Lord's day, because the Lord came by, visited with his people, revived his work, saved the lost, and Father, in answer now to prayer, be pleased to glorify thy dear Son, and the people of God said, Amen and Amen. I'm going to ask one of our elders, our brother, Mr. Norman McElroy, I'm sure he's about somewhere, yes, he's going to come and make some announcements, please. Thank you. We pulled out the third reserve today. <laughs> it's very good uh, to see so many in today, and you are very welcome, especially those that are visiting uh, Donald and Jackie Fleming and their friend uh, from Ukraine. You are all very, very welcome. Hope to see everyone out again tonight. So the simple way here is, as uh, Jackie sent these to me, I'll read them out. Uh, remember today there's a missionary offering. It's for the missionary council of our church. 3 p.m. in the will of God, the open air today is in Parkway down beside the football club and the minibus, I believe, in the car park at 2.45 p.m., weather permitting. And if it takes a turn for the worse, but we're in the hands of God and we keep praying on, and if so, then we'll have a prayer time. 7 p.m. tonight, the gospel service, prayer meeting proceeding at half past six. 8.45 tonight, young people, you remember tonight, young adults rally in Portavogie and come to your church service before you'll have plenty of time to get down the road. Tuesday at 8 o'clock, the prayer meeting, and this Tuesday night we have a deputation from our brother Colin Maxwell. That is Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Friday night again at 10 p.m., the men's prayer meeting. And good to see any man that's free on a Friday night to join the faithful brethren that meet each Friday night. Next Lord's Day is Children's Sunday. And uh, Lorna has requested that we, the, ch the Sunday school children meet at 10 a.m. for the final practice. It's very important. Some weren't able to get out today and we need to go through our pieces next Sunday. So parents, please, 10 a.m. next Sunday and they'll have time before the church service to have uh, quick refreshments in the back, toilets, etc. So please, that's important, 10 a.m. And the services for Children's Day is 11.30 and 7 p.m. And the special speaker is the Reverend Paul Hanna at both services. And that all the children will be taking part in both services. And again, you're reminded, a half an hour of prayer before each service in the hall. Now, next Sunday, there is, there'll be no open air. That is because so many involved in the open air are also involved in the children's days. And there's a lot of... Uh, rushing and going forth. So this last few years, we didn't have the open air on that Sunday. So no open air next Sunday, and then it'll commence as normal the following Sunday. Also, could those who have missionary boxes for Robert, please bring them in over the next couple of weeks. That's missionary boxes for our brother Robert McConnell. Bring them in over the next couple of weeks. And also arrived this morning, and they're in the hall table, I put them up there, is Let the Bible Speak Quarterly magazine. And you're free to take one. They're sitting on the hall table. They're only in this morning. Next Sunday, uh, there's an after church rally in the Martyrs Memorial, and the speaker is uh, the Reverend Julian Patterson, well known to us all and young people. So already, Tick your calendar next Sunday night after church rally and go and support our brother Julian. Robert has also requested that could those in the congregation that are free this Wednesday at 7.30 to be at the church, to go around. Now, you're not wrapping doors. You're just putting the invites for the Bible week 
uh, the Bible Club that will be held on Monday the 4th, Tuesday the 5th, and Wednesday the 6th of July in the hall. So 7.30 if you could come and help Robert and the team to go out and put these invitations through the doors around Cumber. And of course, everything mentioned here is totally in the will of God. But you have heard the announcements and there's a part for you to play. There's not one left out in those different things that you can't help, especially on the Wednesday night. Thank you. Do thank our brother very much indeed for making those announcements, subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Uh, I'd just like to say a word of thanks to those that helped on Friday with our seniors' outing. We went along to the Every Home Crusade or Revival Movement Association over in Canalan, and we witnessed again the working of the factory, the uh, producing the gospel literature, the flashcards, the uh, little booklets and uh, different languages. We had a tremendous day and then we travelled uh, by coach across to Brownlow House in Lurgan and we had a meal. We had a tour of the Brownlow House or the castle and uh, we were greatly blessed and I know folks enjoyed it. I'm sure they were tired when they got back home again but to all who helped and all who provided and all who supported we do appreciate that and to our seniors uh, we trust the Lord will be with you. We meet again in the will of the Lord on the second Friday of September. So it's a little break now, and then we recommence again in the divine will in September. So we wish you God's richest blessing, and I know you'll miss the fellowship, uh, but we will resume in the will of the Lord. Just to make one other announcement, I was handed this uh, sheet the other day by our brother Desi Coffey. He's having an evening of, of uh, praise and gospel evening in aid of Ukraine. They're raising some money uh, for the Ukrainians that are up in Balamoni. I think we have one of them with us today from uh, that group. Uh, so uh, it will be in, I actually think, uh, yes, it's the Queen's Hall, Newton Ards. I couldn't see it there. So the time's there. I put this on the table and you'll be able to look at it, take a little picture of it if you want, or mark down the date. Uh, we will be announcing it again, and there's some various artists taking part, and all the monies raised will be going to help uh, the cause there for those uh, individuals from Ukraine. And I know uh, the Balamoni congregation would appreciate your support. I think that's all by way of announcement. Uh, a lot to take in. Number 46, we'll stand together after the key as we worship, though troubles assail and dangers affright. Though, though friends should all fail and foes all unite, yet one thing secures us, whatever betide, the scripture assures us the Lord will provide. Amen.
Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 15. I should say that there will be supper after the evening service next Lord's Day. I just got a text from our brother Colin just to remind us of that, so I've answered him. So there will be supper uh, next Lord's Day evening, and it's team number two, so you knew who you are. Team number two who will be on the supper for next Lord's Day evening. Please keep that in mind. We're turning to Matthew chapter 15. I know you've been turning to this chapter now for at least three weeks. I think we turned to it on Tuesday night as well. Uh, That's a a fourth week. And uh, if I'm right, I think it's the same portion or very close to it. Yeah, it is. We'll be preaching on tonight from this very same chapter. So it has been a chapter that we've been in now at least for five messages on different little themes. But uh, here we are again in Matthew chapter 15, going to finish off in our meditation on the feeding of the 4,000. So we're breaking in at the chapter for Bible reading at verse 32. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32. Let us all hear again and read together the word of the Lord. And Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and brake them and gave to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full. And they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coasts of Magdala. Amen. We lend our reading there at verse 39. The Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for worship today, the reading of Holy Scripture. And as we come now to the most important part of our worship service, the preaching and hearing of the word, solemnize every heart, intensify the sense of the divine presence, Lift the meeting out of the natural realm, bring it into the supernatural. Take it out of an ordinary meeting, and by thy Holy Spirit we humbly pray, bring it into the extraordinary. Take it out of the usual, what we're used to. Bring it into the unusual by the power of God. And loving Father, to hearer and preacher alike, give help, we pray. And to this end I stand publicly as a candidate for the infilling of the Spirit of the living God. I ask for that anointing, that endowment of power from on high, that enables me as thy servant to preach Christ, to rightly divide the word of truth. To this end, almighty God, I now take the promised Holy Ghost. I take the power of Pentecost to fill me now to the uttermost. I take. He undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. Now, over these past Lord's Day mornings, you know that we've been considering the miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. We've done so, I think, in a more simple way, and yet we've done an exposition of the passage, thoroughly, that is, and not just word by word, as we call it in exegesis, that is, single words all brought out, but we've used just single words to highlight some valuable lesson, some great truth that we have found here in the feeding of the 4,000. The first word we used was calling, straight from uh, the chapter here, and we thought about the Lord who said before he did anything, he called his disciples unto him, he called them into close and intimate fellowship with himself, and how we learn from that, how the Lord desires us to be near him, and then he revealed to them his will. It's a wonderful thing that those who are seeking the will of God and they're not living right will never find it. You've got to be close to the Lord. You've got to be near to God. He called his disciples unto him. And who would have thought in the feeding of the 5,000 and the preaching of that miracle, how often it's missed. 
That great truth that the Lord's desire was to have his children near, to have his people close, to have them in intimate fellowship with himself, that he might speak to them and then he would reveal his will. He would be telling them what he's about to do. And he said the same to Abraham. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing that I shall do? Was it not said of Moses in the Psalm 103 that he made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel? And the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. I'm not saying that we will know all about the future. I'm not saying that we'll understand all that's going to happen in the divine council at the end time, the last days and the return of Christ. But I do say this, that God reveals his mind. He reveals his will. And the feeding of the 4,000, who would have thought that tucked away there was that great gem of truth? The Lord called his disciples unto himself. And then we thought of another word, the word compassion. And how that explained to us the heart of Christ for a multitude. Yet for individuals, yes, but for a multitude. He even told them his heart. The Lord revealed to them his love, his compassion. His grace. He said there in the chapter, I have compassion on the multitude. And then we use the word consistency. You'll notice there is it in verse 33 where he says he called. And then he says, I have compassion. And then he said these words, or in verse 32 rather. He said these words. He says, they have continued with me. They have, or they continue with me. In other words, there was consistency for three days and three nights and we understood what it meant to continue with the Lord. Who would have thought in the feeding of the 5,000 that there would be a lesson, there would be a, a, a truth, gold, a golden nugget tucked away in this mine of truth whereby the Lord would speak about consistency, discipleship, and folks who were willing to rough it in order just to stay true to the Lord and to follow him. Now the final word we want to use to uh, look at this passage, and we're going to finish today, God willing, and it is the word concern. And this has to do with the disciples. First one had to do with Christ calling. The second one, Christ, compassion. And then the disciples or the multitude, they were continuing. And then this is the disciples. They were concerned. You notice what it says there in the verse 33. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have in our possession sufficient, that's what they're saying, so much bread in the wilderness as to feed so great a multitude or fill or satisfy so great a multitude. So here's concern. These disciples were very quick to point out to the Lord the sheer impossibility. Whence should we have? They had nothing to meet the need. And the Lord knew all about that. And there was a reason why he asked the question, how many loaves, how many fishes have you actually got? They were made to face on this occasion their total inability and dependence on the Lord for this miracle. And for this act of grace among these people. They were very quick to point out to Christ the sheer impossibility of such a vast multitude in the wilderness ever being fed. And even if there was a market, there wouldn't be enough bread on sale. And if there was enough bread on sale, we wouldn't even have the money. And neither would the people to buy such a provision. Now, I do believe that some reasons are presented here in this chapter. Some reasons why it would be humanly impossible for these disciples to do anything. And they needed an intervention of God. They needed the Lord to step in. And there's no doubt that there are situations in your life, in your family, in mine. There are situations that are coming right to my mind now. There are needs that I've brought to the Lord already today. There are promises that I have presented before God and pleaded before God. There are passages that I have read this morning that I have brought to the Lord and I have told the Lord as I'm preaching now that I can do nothing about this. It's out of my hands. It's out of my control. And I'm pleading what God has said to me, what God has promised me, and I'm trusting him. 
believing him that he will do as he has said. He's no liar. It's the word of a gentleman. He will never break his word. And what the Lord has promised and what the Lord has said he will perform. And I've brought his word on very serious matters, troubling matters, perplexing matters. I've brought these things to the Lord today. And I've been brought like these disciples to realize that help is without sight of oneself, outside of my best friends, and well-meaning, even ministerial brethren, that these things can only be addressed by God so that he would have all the glory. But he brings us to the point like these disciples where we are cast on him. No such thing as self-sufficiency in the Christian life. It's full of pride, that is. No such thing as self-confidence, although we should be confident in the Lord. I want to tell you there were some reasons presented here in the feeding of the 4,000 why the situation was impossible, humanly speaking. I want to tell you, first of all, their purse was impoverished. If you notice what they said there, they said, whence would we have so much bread? Their purse was impoverished. They didn't have the means to supply this need. Their argument went something like this, if I was to paraphrase. Lord, where's all the money to buy food for these people? Remember, on this occasion, we told you a thousand men had already walked away from the Lord after the sermon of John 6. He fed 5,000 men beside women and children. Then came the sermon, the message on discipleship. The Lord laid down the cost of following him. He laid down the terms of discipleship. No easy believism here. There were terms of discipleship. These don't save you. But it's the life that follows one that is saved by God's grace and born of the Spirit and washed in the blood. Uh, there is a life of discipleship. And when the Lord laid down the conditions and the terms of following him and the cost of discipleship, a thousand men immediately walked away. And when we come to the feeding of the 4,000, a thousand men were missing. And I believe some of their wives and their children as well had departed with them. And he was left with 4,000 men on this occasion beside the women and children that followed. And some, no doubt, were women without husbands. Some, I believe, were children, young people, without their parents because they did say in the feeding of the 5,000, there is a lad here. They didn't say there are parents with a child here. He was on his own following the Lord, a young person. But I'll say this, their argument went like this, not only where is all the money, but where's the bread? I could ever meet a multitude. There's not a single town within reach or a city that could furnish bread on the spot for such a multitude. And even if there was a market nearby and they were all to come with all their wares and sell it, we wouldn't have the money and they wouldn't have the provision. In other words, there could be upwards of eight or 9,000 people and that multitude that needed fed. We don't know. We were 4,000 men besides women and children. And we would sur surmise that at least nine or 10,000 people were present. And they needed fed. And they needed help. And they needed provision. And let's be honest, humanly speaking, the disciples said it themselves. Whence should we have? Where would we have this? We have nothing. Seven loaves and a, and a few little fishes. And those loaves, by the way, they're not your big loaves. And even if they were, they were still scant. They're even smaller. They were like the bread loaf that you would get, the little uh, bop that you would get along with your soup. That's about the size of it. They had seven of them. You nearly could put them on your hand, maybe one or two piled on top. And then they had a few little fishes. We're not told how many, but a few. And they were little. They were small. They were like sardines. They wouldn't have been your big salmon or your trout or any of those great fish. No, they'd have been small, small fish. That's what they would have been. And that's all they had. So the task, humanly speaking, was impossible. And these disciples were concerned. Because the Lord says, I have compassion on the multitude. I not send them away fainting or fasting, lest they faint by the way. And then the disciples moved right away. Had they forgotten? Of course they had. That the Lord had fed 5,000 beside women and children. Not all that long ago. Did they forget 
the breaking of the five loaves and the, few, the two fishes? Did they forget the miracle a few weeks ago? Of course they did. Looking at their situation, they didn't believe it could happen a second time. And what we have here, there's no doubt that the miracle itself was to demonstrate the power of Christ, that he was God. It was to vindicate Christ as the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And despite what the Muslim believe, and the Islamic religion believe about Christ, a good man, a great prophet, they deny the deity of Christ. Well, this miracle, this was a miracle of creation. The magicians of Egypt and the wizards and all those that studied art could not produce a miracle like this. As I told you, there are tricksters, there are magicians today and they mock and mimic in these miracles and they try to do it and have sussed out exactly how they do it. And they try to produce the bread and then the fish out of the bucket and so many fish come out. And we know how they do it. We know their trickery behind it. But not so with Christ. Christ had the bread in his hand. And as he broke, he created. It was a divine act of the creator. And to our Muslim friends, we tell you, Jesus Christ is God. Of very God. Begotten and not made. And he's not just a mere man. Although he is human, born of a virgin. Made bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. For our redemption. But he's deity. Veiled in our humanity. And he did something that day that none but God could do. And in deity, Christ created in his very hands the bread as he broke it. And the fish. And he multiplied them. And that's an act of creation. That's an act of creation. And he could have fed the entire world. 20 million times over. By that same act of breaking and creating. There was no end to his creative power. He called an end to it when they were fed. And he wouldn't have any wastage. He would have them gathered up into baskets. And as they were journeying, they would have distributed to the poor that which was left over. No wastage. I say to you, I tell you, it was a miracle to demonstrate, to vindicate that he was God veiled in human flesh. However, In the secondary sense, it also was a miracle to show these disciples that without Christ, they could do nothing. Not one of those disciples could create bread by their bare hands and their own will. They couldn't do it. They wouldn't have the power and never will. And as far as putting bread into their hands, and you notice Christ took the bread from them. They were divorced from the miracle in that sense. The bread was in his hand, and in his hand it fed a multitude. What a lesson. We'll come to that in a moment or two. It's designed to show these disciples that without Christ, they can do nothing. They're powerless, helpless, insufficient. Now, human nature is full of pride. The best of us are proud sinners. From the pulpit to the pew, there's not a man or a woman that doesn't have resident in the heart now, in the mind, a spirit of pride. It's true. And old pride needs to be broken. And we would imagine we can do things. And we can handle things. And sometimes the Lord can help us with the big things, but the little things we'll sort out ourselves. But if you take those great truths together, Christ, the power of God, and the inability of the disciples, then here's what's being taught In this miracle of the feeding of the 4,000. It's often lost in the miracle itself. And it's this. That we are absolutely nothing without Christ. And we can do nothing without Christ. In fact the Lord said that himself. In John 15, 5. He says, for without me ye can do nothing. You see, just as the branch draws from the vine its life. Its fruitfulness. It's substance. Everything that it needs to thrive. It draws it from being attached in union with the vine. So Christ used the very illusion. And he used the picture and the illustration. I am the true vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me. The same will bring forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So we like the branch draw our strength from Christ. 
We literally draw life from the vine. Power to live the Christian life. Power to say no to sin. Power to say no to the devil. Young person. Power to swim against the tide of peer pressure. To stand up for the Lord and the truth of his word. That abortion is murder. And sodomy is wrong. And euthanasia is wrong. And to stand up for the great truths of the gospel. That there's no salvation in the church. In baptism or confirmation. But in Christ and in Christ alone. And many other fundamentals of the faith. And those doctrines that are being attacked by the world. And the liberals today. Left to ourselves we can do nothing. But you know through the spirit of God. And the grace of God. And the Christ of God. And the word of God. We can draw comfort and strength and encouragement. You cast aside the word of God. You dismiss with any grace from Christ. And you will find little or no comfort in the world. You will find no friend like the Savior. Even the best of your friends, if you gather them all together, their collective love and their collective friendship and their collective desire to help you is not sufficient. And while we're not saying you shouldn't have friends or confide in your friends, we're not saying that. But there's a friend that sticketh closer than any brother. A friend who loveth at all times the blessed Savior. I want to tell you that in Philippians 4.13, Paul penned these words, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And those words, and I'm not trying to be smart. And I don't have a great education. And I borrow my knowledge like many others from those who are the experts and they tell us. That those words I can do is the single word endure. And I'm not trying to be smarter than our translators. Neither am I trying to impress by saying we could switch the word and put the word endure in there. We could. We could without doing any adding or subtracting from the word of God. I can endure. I can suffer. All things through Christ because he continually strengthens me for that. And that's not to lessen anybody's problem. That's not to say that those that are struggling, then you're not relying because the best of men and women, and I'm not in that category, struggle and they wrestle. What about us lesser mortals? What about the trials of life that God has spurred me from? Maybe knowing full well I would fail. Yet the trials you have come through and many others that are listening on the internet and the difficulties you have faced that some of us in 10 lifetimes would never go through. And yet here you are today by the grace and help of God because you can do all things through Christ. You can endure all things. You can suffer all things. You can pass through all things. That's right. You name them. Not one of them is excluded. From the worst possible scenario that you could think of. You can do all things. You can pass through all things. You can endure all things. Because Christ is with you. And Christ is strengthening you. And Christ cares for you. And Christ loves you. And Christ will supply your need. And in your insufficiency. Paul said it himself. The great apostle Paul. Writing to the church at Corinth. In the second epistle. The second letter that he had to write. To that church, he said, he says we're not sufficient of ourselves in the first epistle. But he said these words. He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. That's a contradiction. How could someone, when they're weak, be strong? I'll tell you why. Because we're not dealing on human terms or philosophy here. We're dealing with God. And we're at our weakest. We're cast on him. And when we're cast on him, we receive divine omnipotence. And that's why Paul says, I would rather glory in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. That I may prove the sufficiency of his power to see me through. I'll not be leaning on my own strength. It'll be a staff that will break. It'll be a reed that I will bend. It'll do me no good. It'll be a crutch for a little season, but I'll fall when I let it go, but not so Christ. I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. I want to tell you I can do all things through Christ because he strengthens me. So no matter what we are called upon by God, and remember it's by the Lord's, his divine will, we must submit to it. 
You know, it's a tragedy. And I use that word not glibly. It's not a word that I would use too often. People would say, you know, if they lost their wallet, it's a tragedy. It's not really a tragedy in the true sense of the word. I'd say the war in Ukraine is a tragedy. The shooting of those children in Texas is a tragedy. A young person taken out into eternity, ripped from the family home, is a tragedy. But your washing machine, or tumble dryer, or your slow cooker that didn't work today when you got home and the meat's freezing cold. You say, it will be if you don't hurry up. I know that. That's not a tragedy. But I, I will say this to you. In many ways, uh, there are some things that are a tragedy in this life. And it's a tragedy whenever the Muslim going through worse than even some believers, and I'm not lessening anybody's problems here. I'm not. But the Muslim can pass through great difficulties and they can say this, Allah, I don't believe as a God. Might be a derivation of a name of the Lord, but I don't believe it's the true and the living God. I don't believe it's Jehovah they're worshipping. Some would say he is. But they would submit to Muhammad the prophet, the teachings of the Quran, and Allah is great, or Allah is to be praised. If this is the will of Allah, I submit. What of the believer who worships the true and the living God through the mediator, his son, not Muhammad, his son, Jesus Christ, the true prophet, the only prophet, and every other one is an imposter? And turns on their, on their Lord and their back on God. I want to tell you something. That's a tragedy in every sense of the word. But we're dependent on him and he will not fail us. He faileth not. Can I say not only was their purse impoverished, but the place was impractical. Notice what it says in verse 33. In this wilderness. Do you see it? Whence, whence can we literally feed this multitude? In this wilderness. I'm not saying the disciples said this, but it's like saying, are you mad? Are you crazy? In this wilderness, where are we going to get food? Even if we started to look, what would we ever find in this wilderness? Nothing grows here. There's no harvest. There's no wheat, no corn. There's no pear trees, apple trees. There's nothing here. No dates. No plums. No wine. No nothing. Nothing growing in this wilderness. It's the worst place to think about feeding a single individual, never mind a multitude. You wouldn't survive a day unless you had the skills to dig, wait and look and the know-how where to get the food. Where is food available in the desert? Where is anywhere nearby within reach of even an hour, never mind half a day's journey? And who has even brought among us all enough food? The only thing we have left is seven loaves out of near 10,000 people, and a few little fishes. That's all there is. The rest is gone. So these, this statement of the disciples in verse 33, whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? It was really filled with unbelief. They wrongly assumed that the Lord could not work a miracle. The Lord couldn't do this. The Lord could not provide in a barren and dry wilderness. Such a blessing. He couldn't do it. Such a place was too hard for Christ to work and perform this miracle. Now who would have thought in the feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000. That there would be a gem of truth like this. Sadly things have not changed. Wouldn't you agree? Search your own heart as I look into mine now. We as believers say the same thing as the disciples in our unbelief. The Lord could not work in the life of that sinner. You might see the children kicking football on the football pitches. You might even see, as I did, so-called loyalists, Protestants, building their bonfires on the Lord's day. You might see your neighbor who's no interest in God, a neighbor who doesn't bother with you because you're a Christian. And you might assume, like these disciples, how could God ever work in such a barren heart like that. 
How could God ever save a man or a woman like that? And you know, you mightn't say it out loud, but you could think it in your heart. You may say the Lord could never do a work in the life of that individual. Well, you know, maybe the same could have been said about you and me. It certainly would have been said of me. But people didn't give up. People did believe. People did pray. People did evangelize. People did witness. I want to tell you, if you you read the history of the 1859 revival, and you says, well, I've read it before. Well, I guarantee you there's so much you could read again and reread and relearn. But if you read something of the history of the 1859 revival, the Reverend Hugh Hannah, Roaring Hannah, he said these words, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. He said that prior to the 1859 revival, things were dead. They were barren. Hearts were parched. They were like stone. You could hardly sow a seed. It would just bounce off. It's like the wayside sower falling on the, the seed was falling on the wayside, hard, trodden down ground, never going to grow. The fowls of the earth snatching it away. It seems to be society when you sow the seed, it just bounces back in your face. You're plowing concrete, as we call it. He said these words the two weeks. Two weeks before, that's the state of the people. Two weeks later, fast forward, God came in revival power and blessing. And those people that walked by the church, those people that were doing their grass and they were doing their shopping and they were doing their pleasure on the Lord's day were found in the house of God, troubled about their soul. I want to tell you something. Two weeks previous, like these disciples They were in the wilderness, and how could you ever see them provided for the way they are? And I want to tell you, revival came through the prayers of a a very few individuals, about five or so men that gathered, and there's no doubt there were others praying across the country. But God sent through that channel revival in 1859, and they reckon over 100,000 souls were converted to Christ. In that revival, we'll never know the figure. We'll never know. But we know this, that God came in and two weeks previous, young people that lived for the world were now saved and they're in the house of God. Young people, young children that never went to Sunday school, never came to a children's meeting, never attended church with their parents, they were brought in. And Hugh Hannah said, looking at his congregation, those people, two weeks ago, you wouldn't have given them a single hope. God has worked, God has moved. Revival blessing has come. And you might even say, well, we can't see worldwide revival in the Bible. You might even say, where will revival come prior to the second coming of Christ? Where does it fit in in prophecy? You might even say this, that, and the other. I tell you, God is the God of revival. And he can revive at any time. Have you ever read in your Bible? I'd love to ask you to put your hand up. The days of Elisha. No doubt you'll put your hand up. I've read about the days of Elisha. Have you ever heard a man, his name's not given, he's just given this title. A man from Baal Shalisha. Now before that, that Shalisha was given over to the worship of Jehovah. It was a fruitful place. And then idolatry set in and they changed the name of the place. Prefix it with the name Baal. To symbolize Jehovah's gone. Baal's the true God of this place. And there was a man lived there. In Baal Shalisha. In the days of Elisha. And Elisha was a prophet who worked more miracles than Elijah. The double portion was on him. But here's a remarkable thing. There was a seven year famine. In the days of Elisha. And they were hungry. And there was poison even in the pot. But remarkably, miraculously, for some reason we don't know why, a single individual in a barren place called Baal Shalisha, during a time of famine, a seven year drought, his field, his field alone, brought forth a harvest. And God bypassed the corruption of the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical law stated the first fruits went to the priests. 
And on this occasion, it was bypassed and given to the school of the prophets. And this man from Baal Shalishah, his field brought forth plentifully. He had a harvest in a time of famine. And I suggest this to you. Why could your Sunday school class not have a harvest? Why could our Friday night youth meeting not have a harvest? Why could our young adults meeting and meetings not have a harvest among our young people? Why can Cumber, Free Church, or any other church faithful to the Lord not have a harvest? Even though among evangelicals, there's a downgrade. There's declension, either spiritually or numerically. Why could we not, in our little wilderness or desert, if that's how you view it, see the Lord work and to become a very fruitful field? It can. And we're not trying to be selfish. Neither should we be envious or jealous if a church up the road started to thrive and our work went down numerically and theirs went up, not by people going to them, but God saving, God moving, bringing new people in. We might even say with envy or jealousy, why? Why has he not done it for me? Why has he not done it for us? Would we not humble our hearts and fall to our faces on the ground and worship and just say it is the Lord, let him do what seemeth him good. And if it pleaseth the Lord to come and do it here, then let him, let his will be done. But there's nothing wrong with being in a sanctified way parochial. I'm wanting the best for this part of the vineyard in which God has called us to, to work in. And we're not parochial, we do reach out beyond the four walls of this church. But I tell you something, the place was not impractical. And their purse was not really impoverished. Because the Lord was introduced into the situation. Can I tell you one last argument against it all was this. The people were immense. Notice in verse 30 it says great multitudes came unto him. And we know that there were thousands followed him. And at least on this gathering there was about 10,000 people we would imagine. Now if there had been a smaller crowd, well, you know you could do it if it was a smaller crowd. But not such a big crowd. You know, the massive problem of feeding nearly 10,000 people was beyond faith and of the best of Christ's followers, if we're honest. And sometimes we imagine that if our problems were a little bit smaller, the Lord could just work them out. Maybe even we could have a little input. Maybe we could help the Lord and we could sort some things out ourselves. But I want to tell you, no problem or trouble is beyond the help of an intervention of Christ. And I repeat that, no problem and no trouble that you're facing is beyond the help and intervention of Christ. And if it was the case, and I, I thank the Lord it's not always the case because God is merciful and he's gracious and he's loving. Be it unto you according to your faith. We may not get much from the Lord, you know, if it was based on me believing. Quite often the Lord does, and he, he most certainly does reward faith. And we know that it's impossible to please him without faith. But even if our faith is as small as the grain of a mustard seed, you could see it on the tip of your finger. I want to tell you, you'll see an answer from God. The Lord lays down the challenge as I finish this study in the feeding of the 4,000. And here's what he's saying to these disciples and he's saying to us. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And I challenge this congregation and our online listeners, you send the message, send the email to me. And we're, not, we're talking theologically here. We know there are impossibilities with God. He can't lie. He can't save you apart from Christ. He can't deliver your soul from hell if you fall into hell. They're impossibilities. But we're talking about our God doing something for his people. Is there anything? Is there anyone? Is there any community? Too far away, too bad. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? With God, all things are possible. Christ brought these disciples as he has brought us now to an end of ourselves and themselves and he has caused them and us to see our utter inability and insufficiency before he works the miracle. How many loaves have ye? Was a question. Not, of course the Lord knew how many loaves. He's omniscient. He's God. He could exercise the power of divinity if he chose. And he knows exactly 
He might even have said there's not just seven, but there's a family over there have some. There's a couple of people over there have hid them. But the disciple says we have seven. Why did he ask the question? He knew it. He could have said, bring them loaves to me. No, the Lord knew exactly how many loaves there were. And he brought the disciples to confess their inability. How many loaves have you? We've only seven, Lord. They were to look at their own insufficiency there in their hand. And then they took their insufficiency. And I like this. It says they gave it to Christ. And the Bible says he took. Now the word took doesn't mean he took it forcibly. It simply means that he received gladly that which was given to him. And he multiplied it. He blessed it. And a multitude was fed. In closing, I want you to do something today. I want you to give your life now as a believer to Christ. If you're not saved today, I want you to give your heart in repentance and faith to Christ. And he will bless you. But for those who are saved, you bring yourself today first and put your life in the hand of Christ. Then bring your family and put your family into the hand of Christ. It says he took, that is, he received gladly. He didn't say, I don't need that. I don't need to use that. I don't want that. The Bible says he took the bread and the fishes. And that word means he didn't forcibly take them. As they were offered, he, he received them. That little meager supply, your little talent or gift, your little life, your family. On the world's view, you're only a number, national insurance number, or you may be obscure. But the Lord knows all about you. And when it's in his hand, the Bible says he looked up to heaven, he gave thanks, he broke, and he blessed, and he multiplied, and he fed. I want you to do something. Put your life in his hand. Put it in his hand today, saved or unsaved, and trust him. I believe that we place ourselves in the work of God here in Cumber into the hand of Christ and he will bless and he will use us to feed the hungry multitudes around us. Let's bow in prayer. Our loving Father, in human weakness the word is sown, but by divine power it shall live. And we pray, Lord, the voice of man growing cold and silent, the words of a mere man falling to the ground and dying, but that which is of thyself will live on and cannot fail. Back at home, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, burn it in. Bless it to every heart. Bring precious souls to Christ. Save them by thy grace. And Lord, bless thine inheritance, thy people today. Whatever problems they're struggling with, whatever difficulties they're facing, whatever cross they have to bear, whatever trouble they're going through, whatever waters they're passing through, whatever fire or river, and Lord, even if they're on the mountain top in blessing, we pray you remember them today. Jesus has a care. Lord bless, we pray. Supply every need according to thy riches and glory by Christ Jesus, and multiply to bless today. We offer this our prayer, giving thanks in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. Amen. And amen. Amen.